Je viens de vous présenter comme psychiatre à la fois professeur associé à Toronto. Vous êtes à la fois clinicien et chercheur et vous travaillez depuis de longues années sur la question des liens entre le sexe, le genre et leur implication sur la clinique et l'accompagnement des personnes autistes. C'est donc sur ce sujet que nous avons hâte de vous écouter. Merci à vous. Nous vous écoutons. Thank you very much. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you all. Uh, I, I, I had hoped that I would be able to deliver some greetings in France, uh, in French, but I'm not able to. I really hope that I can be there with all of you. Uh, the last time I visited uh, Lyon was almost 10 years ago, and I still remember the beautiful place. Um, unfortunately, I have some family matters I have to connect with you uh, from Taipei in Taiwan. Um, so I understand this is the last talk of the day and I hope uh, uh, we uh, we can all enjoy um, the 45 minutes or 50 minutes uh, uh, to uh, reflect and think about issues about sex and gender, especially when it uh, comes to the diagnosis and clinical care for autistic people. So the, the main reason why people care about sex and gender can be quite well delineated by this uh, very nice study from Will Mendy's um, group is looking at a meta-analysis of epidemiological studies of the sex or gender ratio uh, of autism prevalence across the world. You can see that the general picture is this 4.2 to one male to female ratio, which is not surprising, which is usually how people get um, you know, written in the, in the, in the, um, in the textbook. However, if you stratify the studies based on how samples are ascertained, then you get a difference there. So for those studies who uh, went into the population and conduct a, uh, a, a screening and then look at a diagnosis of autism using gold standard measures, you get the male-female ratio about 3.25 to 1. If you rely on those studies which are focused on um, as existing educational or medical clinical databases, you get a more uh, a higher ratio of 4.56 to 1. And this tells us two things. First, there is the possibility of under recognition of girls and women uh, in the um, current medical or educational uh, practices. However, even accounting for that, then there is still a biased male-female ratio uh, according to uh, this, like still uh, more likely uh, males will be diagnosed with autism, even in population-based sample. So that brings uh, us to this idea of a framework of explaining why we care about sex and gender in autism. And I would argue that there's this ABCs um, for the reasons that we care about sex and gender. So the first one is clinical care. Um, sex and gender may modulate uh, the recognition, presentation, adaptation of the individuals, and also developmental changes. Um, pertaining to autism. Sex and gender may also explain some biological heterogeneity and they can actually have implications on etiological aspects related to this so like sex and gender related vulnerability. So for today's talk, I will be focusing on the clinical care part. But before diving into the findings and the implications of that, um, we need to acknowledge some caveats. First of all, most of the studies that we have to date uh, include uh, biased samples. There are many underrepresented populations, for example, in non-English speaking countries, in lower or middle income countries, uh, a lack of representation of racial ethnic diversity and so on. And, and for sure, uh, under uh, rep representation of female individuals or gender diverse individuals is inherent in this literature. But also there is a lack of uh, differentiation between sex and gender factors. So the general idea is that in English language, sex is not equal to gender. They both are multiple component constructs and they sometimes are non-binary and often multi-categorical or some aspects are continuous. So the caveat for the literature so far is that 
most of the autism clinical and neuroscience research still treats sex and gender as a single binary variable. So essentially, it's a proxy measure. And it doesn't really give us clear idea about what that measure uh, reflects or implies. Um, there can be mitigations to this for future research, but we're not there yet. The mitigation should be measuring the complexity to capture more variances and to measure the specific components that are relevant. So, for example, if you're arguing biological process related to sex may serve as a vulnerability factors, then we should actually measure the biological process themselves. If you're arguing gender has a role in recognition of autism, we should actually focus on what aspect of gender that has the role. So, for today's talk, I want to um, divide my, my, my uh, presentation into two parts. One is based on what we talked about, what have we learned from research that may have a clinical implications about sex and gender effects in the recognition, diagnosis, and development of autistic individuals? And then the second part, I would try to summarize this to say, how can this inform us for clinical care uh, moving forward? To start with, the status quo is that autism tends to be recognized or diagnosed later in female individuals than male individuals. And here, what I mean by that is assigned sex at birth. Uh, although there's a wide variety of age of diagnosis based on population derived data set, uh, the median age, for example, here is a study from the state, the United States 20 years ago in their uh, national surveillance data, you can see females uh, actually are, on average, recognized later than male individuals. And this is 20 years ago. So these are mostly more classical autism, uh, autistic individuals with more classical presentations. Uh, in some more recent data, for, for example, here in the UK primary care database, you can see that the recognition rate of autism or diagnosis of autism has increased quite substantially in the past 20 years. And uh, that's especially more so for female individuals in the past 10 years. So there are better recognition, at least in the UK uh, context, uh, for female individuals to be recognized and diagnosed with autism. However, even with that, across the data set, the mean age of diagnosis is still later for female individuals than male individuals. And this is across jurisdictions. Uh, for example, here we had an ongoing work looking at the Ontario uh, population-based data sets in Canada, looking at age of first autism diagnosis claim in the health services uh, database for those who are diagnosed before age of 30. We see that there is a shift, a slight shift, but significant shift, again, for girls and women, and those are female assigned at birth, to be diagnosed a bit later than boys and men. So I would argue there are two directions or two broad factors accounting for this, uh, this issue. The first is contextual factor and the second is individual factor. For the contextual factors, there can be multiple things. Expectancy bias, meaning that given that autism has historically been more recognized in males, if a female individual presents autism features, it's less likely clinicians may think about autism. There can be gender stereotypes getting in the way. There can be what we call diagnostic overshadowing, like one diagnosis coming, uh, uh, being, a, being given to the individual, then a autism diagnosis may actually be uh, postponed. So these may all affect recognition of autism in non-male individuals. So this whole idea really uh, has been well demonstrated from these studies almost 10 years ago. So here, as you can see from the bar graph, uh, represents the study from a general population-based twin sample in the UK, the TED sample. In this study, they have uh, girls who are clinically diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, and they are compared to girls who have high autistic traits. As you can see, those who have clinical diagnosis but equivalent high traits from, from the comparison group showed higher percentage having concurrent intellectual or emotional behavior problems. The same pattern is there for boys, but that is less substantial in boys. So this implies that girls need more happening to them concurrently for them to be diagnosed with autism clinically. Uh, 
It has been almost replicated in a consecutive referral sample in the Netherlands. Here you can see that all those girls who eventually get diagnosis of autism actually has higher uh, CBCL scores, which is representing parent-reported emotional behavior issues. Again, speaking to the possibility that girls need more clinical challenges for them to be clinically recognized with autism. The best um, example probably comes from this one, which is a uh, large research and clinical database collected in Washington, D.C., in the United States, led by Alice Rattle. What they did here is that they match uh, the autistic boys and girls, school age autistic boys and girls, on their ADOS scores, meaning that they represent similar levels of uh, autism related features behaviorally judged by the clinician. Within these two groups, boys and girls, the girls actually are scored with higher autistic traits on the SRS by their parents, and also they have lower adaptive functioning skills. So this means that the girls need to have more autistic characteristics and lower adaptive functioning for them to show comparable clinical uh, autistic features uh, with boys. Another example here comes from the province of Ontario Neurodevelopment Disorders Network data. So as you can see, we plot um, the verbal IQ against age of diagnosis of autism based on ADAR data. Overall, girls are diagnosed later than boys to start with. Across both sexes, the higher verbal IQ, the later you're diagnosed. So basically the idea is that if you are more verbally articulate, you might be recognized with autism later. But that slope is more so for girls. So meaning the effect is stronger in girls compared to boys. Now, there are some studies showing that uh, diagnostic overshadowing may play some role. Uh, this is from the Netherlands Autism Register. And if you look at the adult side of the data set, you can see they ask about prior diagnosis that are no longer present after autism diagnosis being made. You can see, especially for women, uh, female individuals compared to male individuals, there are more diagnoses being dropped after autism diagnosis has been made, particularly personality disorders, a range of mood anxiety disorders, uh, even ADHD and other diagnoses. So speaking to the possibility that there are some other diagnoses of uh, that's not autism was given prior to autism diagnosis and dropped after that, but maybe that postponed the timing of autism diagnosis, especially for female individuals. And also in the, in the Netherlands uh, register, if you look at the children data set, you can see there is evidence suggesting there is a delay in receiving autism diagnosis uh, if there is a pre-existing ADHD diagnosis. And that delay is particularly stronger in girls compared to boys. So speaking to the uh, like supportive evidence for the effect of diagnostic overshadowing. On the other hand, there are um, evidence against the idea. So this is a latest uh, publication from the Danish patient registry. They look at only those individuals who have been given autism diagnosis in adulthood. And then they look at the database to see what other diagnosis has been given prior to age of 18. Um, and they also analyzed uh, the data prior to 12 as well. But let's look at this prior to age of 18. You can see that, yes, there is a general tendency that girls uh, are likely to have uh, more affective disorder, anxiety disorder, eating disorder, and stress-related conditions uh, given prior to their uh, autism diagnosis, uh, which is given in, um, in, uh, uh, in adulthood. However, the authors argue that the majority of those individuals who are given autism diagnosis in adulthood actually do not have a prior diagnosis of any kind. Uh, so for example, here for girls, uh, it's uh, about 40%, less than 40% of them do have a diagnosis uh, that's not autism. And the majority actually do not have another diagnosis. So they argue that this is evidence against diagnostic overshadowing because the majority of individuals do not have a prior diagnosis. And this is still an ongoing uh, discussion about the role of other diagnosis. Um, 
there, this is one of the first uh, experimental findings looking at how um, uh, w what kind of gender-related stereotype may play a role. So in Will Mandy's uh, lab, uh, we collaborated and created clinical vignettes describing autism phenotypes uh, about children. There are two factors or two manipulations. One is how the phenotypes are described. Uh, it was called female autism phenotype to represent the more nuanced presentation. And I would argue later, this is not the right term. But anyhow, there's this more nuanced presentation and there's all more this like more classical presentation. But the other manipulation was the name of the child in English language, um, so implying the child is a boy versus a girl. So uh, there are, it's a two factorial design. And the outcome measure was that these vignettes are presented to primary school educators and asking them how likely you are going to refer this child for an assessment for autism. So the finding was that if the presentation is classical, no matter they are given a boy's name or girl's name, they're equally likely for the uh, primary school educator to refer them for autism assessment. But if the presentation are more nuanced, and also, if you are given the girl's name, it's much less likely you are going to uh, be referred for autism assessments compared to if the presentation was attached to a boy's name. So this is probably the first experimental study showing that, well, the gender of the child given by their name is actually playing a role of how likely this person will be, uh, 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 will be thought of uh, re uh, having the need to receive an autism assessment. So this is a quote from, um, from one of our, our, our study participants. It's a qualitative study. Uh, this is a quote from a teenage girl who received her diagnosis of autism at the age of 12. And she told her parents, you know what my problem is? I'm Sheldon, but I look like Penny. So for those of you who don't know, this is a American uh, TV series called The Big Bang Theory. So Sheldon on the left is the stereotypical geeky Asperger type of um, a smart young person who's a physicist. Uh, on the right is Penny, who is like this Californian village girl stereotype. So the, our, the participants' argument is like, you know, I'm autistic, but I don't look like autistic because I'm a girl. So that may be uh, playing a role of why I'm underrecognized. So that's the contextual factor. I'm going to shift gear a little bit to this individual factors about what sex and gender related factors can probably modulate and how they modulate autistic behavior presentations and their developmental trajectories. So the first message coming from the literature, which is quite well known now, is that if you look at those people who are clinically diagnosed with autism already, if you look at the conventional measures that has been used for clinical diagnosis, you see a, on average, lower restricted repetitive behavior interest scores in girls compared to boys. And that's across ADOS or ADAR or CARS. Interestingly, in this large scale study, collecting um, data sets across many labs, they show that if you look at SRS, which is uh, a, a trait measure prevent, uh, 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 reported by the parents, girls receive more severe scores than boys emerging from adolescence. So I'm coming back to this later on. This speaks to some fact of there's a developmental trajectory or developmental contextual effects happening in adolescence that might might uh, be particularly challenging for girls than boys. However, the study uh, speaks to the fact that um, um, there's no clear evidence that if you're going to use these instruments, you have to shift the threshold or cutoff because it's, uh, the difference is not uh, as substantial as you would expect uh, to the need to shift the threshold. However, they also acknowledge they cannot address any sex or gender differences in the phenotypic aspects that's not captured by these instruments or not well captured by these instruments. And this is probably the, um, the most important findings in the past few years, that there are sex and gender modulated behavior presentations that uh, may not be well captured by current measures so far. Uh, 
another aspect of the current measure is that if you look at the details of the RBI, uh, it's not the generally lower score in girls um, only. If you look at the specific domains or subdomains, boys tend to have higher repetitive motor behaviors, motor mannerisms, and more circumscribed interest, which some people uh, attribute that to some of the bias recognition of a more stereotypically autistic interest attached to boys and gender typical interest is less recognized as restricted interest uh, related to autism in girls. However, that's what the scores show. Uh, boys tend to have higher mannerism scores than girls, higher circumscribed interest score than girls, but girls tend to have more compulsions and self-injurious behaviors uh, than, 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 than boys. They also found that uh, conventional screeners for younger children like MCHAT or SCQ may actually under-identify RBIs uh, in toddler and preschool aged girls. Now, I'm going to um, show you a few empirical studies pointing to the possible uh, presence of uh, sex and gender modulated behaviors that's not well captured by conventional measures. So this is a series of study led by Claire Harrop in North Carolina in the United States. So Claire used eye tracking to uh, check the attention or social attention from autistic and non-autistic girls and boys who are school age. They presented these uh, uh, videos of uh, kids playing in parallel or interacting. So here in the like, socially heavy interacting play, you can see there is a cascade effect of the time that child spent on looking at the face of the children, which is a representation of uh, social attention. So typically developing girls paid the most attention uh, two faces, followed by typically developing boys, followed by autistic girls, followed by autistic boys. So interestingly, there is the diagnostic effect, but there's also a sex or gender effect. And uh, autistic girls actually lie in between uh, typically developing counterparts and autistic boys. So they actually have higher social attention. We recently replicated this finding, again, using dynamic uh, uh, video, and this is work led by Teresa Del Bianco using the EU Ames LEAP data. Uh, and equally, we have this cascade effect in uh, attention paid to the faces areas. So autistic uh, girls uh, uh, show more attention than autistic boys, but less than non-autistic boys and non-autistic girls. And these are aged 6 to 30. So it's not only boys and girls, but also men and women as well. So this is like replicated finding of increased attention in autistic girls than autistic boys. Uh, the, the, another interesting aspect is this like linguistic feature. So this is a really great study I like so much, uh, led by Julia Parrish Morris in the uh, in Pennsylvania. So what they found was that uh, if you uh, they invited autistic girls and boys and non-autistic boys and girls uh, to an unstructured conversation with a college student for five minutes, they analyzed the linguistic sample, trying to uh, uh, pinpoint how much they talk about socially related terms. So the general peach picture is that girls, no matter they're autistic or non-autistic, talk more about social, socially related terms. But they also analyze the use of we and they uh, as referring to uh, like social, social, socially related aspects. So they found that autistic girls and non-autistic girls uh, use we, they all together similarly, but autistic girls use more they than we, and non-autistic girls use more we than they. And they're both more often used than autistic boys. So their interpretation is that autistic girls actually uh, pay attention to, uh, to the social context, but they use more they, so they're more likely excluded by the social groups. And that actually connects quite well to uh, a series of qualitative studies looking at friendship and social motivation. So this, these are examples by Felicity Citrick's work in the UK. So Felicity and team uh, went into uh, mainstream and also special needs schools uh, in, in England, and they uh, interviewed uh, uh, teenagers, autistic, non-autistic, boys and girls, they analyze the themes related to friendship. So 
on the right hand side, you can see these are the themes coming out of autistic boys or non autistic boys. And they're quite similar. There's actually no differences uh, in terms of the theme generated. But in the girls' side, both autistic and non autistic girls, teenage girls, uh, talked a lot about different themes. And again, there are lots of commonality. But one unique theme that appeared in autistic girls, but not non autistic girls, is friends are hard work. So their interpretation is that autistic girls actually shared similar levels of friendship loneliness uh, compared to a non-autistic girls. It's actually the same for autistic boys as well. But autistic girls find uh, friendships particularly hard to manage. So the idea is that uh, the, the myth of autistic people do not need friends is actually a wrong perception. And it's actually a stereotypical perception. Autistic people uh, equally uh, may likely to uh, want to have friends that are developmentally appropriate. And also they have social motivation that are intact. The, the third example here is more about developmental aspects. So this is uh, data that's not autism specific. It's actually a population-based uh, cohort study data in the LSPEC cohort in the UK. And this is led by Will Mandy's group. They analyzed a score uh, which is related to social communication traits uh, associated with autism. It's called SCDC. They show that through uh, late childhood all the way to uh, uh, teenage, there is a gender or sex difference here uh, between boys and girls. You can see in a late childhood, boys are scored higher on this on this uh, instrument than girls, but the girls sort of like catch up to have heightened social communication challenges reported by the parents starting at teenage, and then by the end of teenage, they actually show equal level of social communication challenges at the general population. So this is general population context. There seems to be something happening in teenage years or in adolescence that makes social communication challenges particularly salient for girls. And there, there can be multiple reasons to that about developmental effect, social cultural effects, gender stereotypes or gender role, for example. But that may be related to the fact that um, this is a data uh, from uh, Scotland uh, about referral rates for autism assessment. You can see that be before the age of 10, the male-female uh, ratio for the referral rate is about 5 to 1 or 5 to 5, 5.5 5 to 1. But it actually dropped quite a lot to 2 to 1 starting teenage all the way into adulthood. There's some clinic, clinics nowadays even reporting a close to 1 to 1 male-female ratio into referral rate. So this speaks to the possibility that there is a group of people uh, who may be autistic who do not uh, have the need to refer to be referred for a clinical assessment or who are simply uh, flying on the radar. But somehow since teenage, uh, there is a decompensation happening. So, so, so their needs for autism assessment actually comes up uh, since teenage and all the way into adulthood. On the other hand, even for those who are recognized or diagnosed very early in life, there is actually something quite different um, uh, from our stereotype. So the stereotype that we hold was that people who are diagnosed with autism, if there are girls, they tend to be more cognitively impaired. They're more likely to have epilepsy. They're more likely to have genetic conditions. They're more likely to have neurological deficits. Um, however, uh, Emerging data actually shows a picture that's actually in contrast to that. So this is a, a, a large scale consortium called Baby Siblings Research Consortium, which essentially tracks those babies who already has an older sibling who are autistic. So they track the development of those babies from birth uh, all the way uh, to uh, third year and now actually into their teenage but they're trying to make a diagnosis to see how much they, uh, they are, how autistic they are, or even do they meet the criteria for autism diagnosis by age of three. So as you can see, uh, uh, these are four subscales on the MULIN about developmental cognitive development. For those boys and girls who are diagnosed with autism and they are already at higher probability of developing autism to start with, the girls developed much better or statistically significantly better 
across all domains compared to those boys who are diagnosed with autism at the age of three. So this is actually in contrast to the thought that people have that girls are more uh, developmentally delayed. Actually, if you track those people from birth, if you catch everyone uh, who had heightened probability of developing autism, girls tend to develop better uh, across the board. And this is a sex differences that's not uh, specific to diagnostic state status because it's actually the same across other groups as well. So it might reflect the, the, the fact that the, uh, the, the stereotype or assumption of girls being more severe is reflecting ascertainment bias. It's because all those girls who have been diagnosed in the past are more severe uh, girls. So you have this impression that they're actually more severe uh, in terms of cognitive uh, uh, development or uh, neurological deficits. But it doesn't seem to be uh, the case if you track them from early in life. The same message actually comes out of other studies, longitudinal studies as well. So this is a Pathways in ASD study, which is an inception cohort uh, led by Peter Zamari in Canada. So this cohort tracked those who are diagnosed with autism by age two to four, all the way into adulthood. In the data-driven analysis, looking at trajectories of ADOS score over time, there are two groups coming out of the data-driven clustering. There's a group of high ADOS score across the board, across development, but there's also a declining group, which show declining or less obvious autistic features, at, at least uh, captured by ADOS. And girls are actually enriched in this declining group. The same message has been replicated um, in uh, uh, another uh, cohort uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, UC Davis in the States. So in this study, they also cluster people based on their ADOS score, and there is a declining group, which is also enriched by girls. So the picture here seems to suggest there are two possible distributions. For those who are recognized or diagnosed with autism early in life, uh, if they are recognized from very early in life, it seems to be the case that the girls had a, a better development over time. Uh, so their cognitive development seems to be better. Their autistic outward features seems to change over time as well. On the other hand, there might be people who are not di diagnosed early in life, but they are recognized uh, at some point in teenage or adulthood. And there's a need coming out since teenage of adulthood that might be related to that specific developmental um, stage. So the fourth example here speaks to the idea of social coping. And uh, many people use the term masking or camouflaging or passing as non-autistic, which initially comes out of uh, autistic adults' description of trying to fit in. And uh, uh, our work uh, with uh, Laura Hall and uh, Will Mandy uh, stemmed from a uh, qualitative study that we created uh, uh, instruments, self-report instruments about behavior experiences uh, that's related to camouflaging or masking. So CAT-Q is the instrument that we created. We also have created uh, operationalization about how these can be um, defined based on the discrepancy of one's outward behavior and one's internal autism status related to cognition and also self-reported traits. So in uh, secondary data analysis, we show that in the adult sample we have, uh, women, autistic women tend to have heightened uh, camouflaging score, so higher discrepancy between these outward and inward uh, features, than, uh, and then boys and men. Um, in my perspective, the best way to characterize this is actually real-world behaviors. Um, so this is a study carried out by uh, Michelle Dean in Connie Kessler's group in UCLA. Um, they went into schools to record and video record uh, uh, boys and girls' uh, playground behavior. They analyze the kind of uh, playground behaviors by their types. So you can see there are uh, behaviors or activities related to structured games. There are these behaviors called joint engagement, which is essentially uh, kids are a side of each other. There's also this solitary activity. So Unfortunately and not surprisingly, autistic boys and girls spend most time in solitary activities, but autistic girls actually spend quite a bit of time uh, being around other girls and to the extent that's actually uh, higher than non-autistic boys. So the idea here is that if you simply look from afar, look at uh, whether 
so this girl is uh, with a group is, or included in a group, autistic girls tend to be hidden there because they can be around a group, although they, their interaction quality or whether there's communication difficulties happening there uh, is not clear until you dive into uh, what actually is happening with them. But there is, a, there is a tendency that they can be around people, so um, their challenges may not be recognized. So this is an idea of camouflaging or masking, uh, considering the, uh, the gendered context. There's another great example here, which is uh, an experimental task. So this is a task that's uh, called interactive drawing test, which is uh, essentially similar to uh, Winnicott's uh, squiggle. So basically the experimental draw something, inviting the child to draw and to see how interactive the drawing is like. So the, the, the study involved autistic boys and girls and non-autistic boys and girls, but importantly, these autistic boys and girls had uh, similar levels of mentalizing ability and similar levels of autistic uh, traits. But you can see autistic girls actually, sorry, autistic boys spent much less time uh, in interacting during this task. So it's less interactive or less reciprocal compared to non-autistic boys. But autistic girls actually are equivalent at the level of interaction or reciprocity compared to non-autistic girls, showing that even with similar levels of cognitive challenges or autistic features, behaviorally, autistic girls just look like they are more reciprocating with uh, uh, the experimenter to the same level as non-autistic girls. So another example to show that uh, this might be camouflaging. But it is important to recognize that what people call camouflaging is actually not diagnostic to autism. It's not autism specific. It is reflecting uh, what we call impression management, which is essentially how people present themselves in front of other people considering the context. So what's unique for autistic people is that uh, the motivation driving for the need for masking or camouflaging may differ because autistic people are uh, within a more socially less favorable uh, position in a neurotypical context. And also because the it's like impression management or camouflage involves lots of uh, cognitive resources. And it's particularly uh, challenging for autistic people because their like almost social prior is not the same as their neurotypical context. But there are emerging evidence showing that if autistic people are interacting with other autistic people, the uh, relationship, the, the reward uh, of the interaction, and then the information processing is actually better than a mixed neurotype. Uh, 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 dyad, suggesting that the need of camouflaging and even the consequences is actually context dependent. It's not within a person. So, so these are like some ongoing work that uh, probably would happen uh, based on this latest theoretical work uh, that we have just published. So um, before entering the clinical aspect or translating those things that I talked about, um, I would like to highlight, we also need to be aware that healthcare needs uh, in autistic people are high, and especially in autistic girls and women. So this is the, late, uh, the latest meta-analysis that uh, has been conducted by our group, looking at the rate of co-occurring psychiatric diagnosis. We can see there's a high rate of ADHD, anxiety disorder, depression, and not surprisingly all the way, literally all the kinds of uh, psychiatric diagnosis are more prevalent in autistic people compared to non-autistic people. However, if you look at the meta-regression effect, those studies who have higher proportion of girls and women tend to report higher rates of depression. So this reflects what's happened in the general population, but highlights the importance of uh, recognizing uh, heightened depression in autistic girls and women specifically. It is also important to look at physical health conditions. So here uh, uh, we had a scoping review and uh, looking at physical health findings in autistic girls and women, which showed they have overall heightened physical health challenges uh, compared to autistic boys and men and non-autistic girls and women. Uh, the rate of epilepsy is also higher in autistic girls and women. But more specifically, there are emerging evidence suggesting that for autistic girls and women, they also have higher prevalence of endocrine and reproductive health issues uh, compared to non-autistic girls and uh, women. So this suggests that um, 
a women's health lens is actually necessary to be incorporated to the, uh, the care for autistic girls and women, given the heightened uh, rates. There's another important intersection, which is the intersection with gender diversity. So on the left, this uh, is a study by Jerome de Winter from the Netherlands cohort, showing that uh, in the adult cohort, uh, uh, autistic male assigned at birth and female assigned at birth actually had quite high rates of identifying uh, with uh, non-cisgender identities. And that's particularly the case for those female assigned at birth. The same pattern of enhanced uh, uh, diversity in sexual orientation has also been reported in this Netherlands sample. On the other aspect, uh, in this large-scale uh, questionnaire-based study led by Varun Warrior from Cambridge, uh, we found that in the transgender and gender diverse populations, there's also heightened uh, rates of uh, autism diagnosis and other neurodevelopmental and psychiatric diagnosis as well. So there are co-occurrence happening for the two sides. Um, we looked at the data from uh, the province of Ontario Neurodevelopment Disorders Network, and this is led by my PhD student, Kelly Moo. We used an instrument called the GIQC, which is a parent report instrument, uh, quite well validated one, looking at gender expression and identity uh, diversity. And we're trying to, to see what uh, demographic factors or sex and categorical versus dimensional neurodevelopmental traits or uh, diagnosis uh, and also behavior emotional problems, like do they predict gender diversity uh, in identity and expression? So we found that uh, in general, there's a main effect of sex that assigned at birth, which is corresponding to what was found. So girls uh, or female assigned at birth tend to be uh, recognized by their parents as having higher uh, uh, in concurrence gender expression or identity uh, compared to boys assigned at birth, uh, male assigned at birth. But interestingly, autism or ADHD diagnosis themselves, categorical diagnosis are not predictors, but it's the social communication traits at age four to five that shows a strong, uh, significant uh, association with uh, uh, inconcurrent gender identity expression, especially expression. Uh, in the across the population, so it doesn't seem to be a diagnosis uh, uh, specific phenomenon, but more of a trait uh, or dimensional trait associated phenomenon. Okay, so these are like the research findings, and in the last five to ten minutes, I want to quickly summarize how can we bring these into uh, clinical uh, considerations for clinical care. So I want to like, highlight one point. There's this increasing use of the term female autism phenotype, which I think uh, would be helpful initially to uh, enhance uh, our awareness of how sex and gender might affect autism. But it's actually a misleading term because there is really no uh, specific phenotype of autism that's determined by one sex or gender. Rather, I think uh, it uh, reminds us of the possible nuanced phenotypes of autism that can be modulated by sex or gender. And these nuanced phenotypes can present in uh, individuals of different sex, different gender, or uh, uh, across cisgender, gender non-binary, or uh, transgender individuals. So I highlighted a few um, possible clinical considerations uh, organized by the DSM uh, five uh, categories, and these can be reorganized into ICD 11 for sure. But let, let's use the DSM five terminology for the time being. So, in the social emotional reciprocity domain, uh, what we learned from the research is that the nuanced phenotype actually may be those uh, individuals who are autistic, but they can have attention and interest to social stimuli, uh, and they can be modulated by the gendered context and how they are uh, brought up. Uh, the gendered expectations would actually likely enhance their social attention and interest. Um, because of the, again, the gendered context, uh, contextual effects, conversation can be superficially back and forth. Uh, it can be scripted politeness and well-rehearsed asking questions, or it's seemingly four away, but mostly offering own experiences or views. However, the reciprocity actually uh, become uh, 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 less uh, smooth or less efficient when the topic shifts or when it is unfamiliar context or when the complexity increases, for example, in a group conversation.
Uh, however, if they talk about interest, it can be more reciprocal uh, and more natural. Uh, and uh, th there's a misleading uh, stereotype that autistic people uh, are, have lack of empathy, which is a wrong terminology, because they may have difficulties with cognitive aspects, like intuitive understanding of other people's mental status, but their affective empathy uh, is actually most likely intact, and they can show sympathy and uh, willingness to help, especially towards animals. In the aspect of nonverbal communication, uh, many of these can be uh, learned or uh, masked or compensated uh, through developmental process, but they can be exaggerated or inflexible. Many of the difficulties may lie in the understanding of nonverbal communications. And uh, they would subjectively report uh, how they learn and force their alternative ways of making eye contact or facial expressions. And there's an effort coming into this. But when they do that, they may actually disrupt the verbal aspect of exchange. So uh, autistic people will tell us that it's actually harder for them to look at people and talk to people. It's easier to look to somewhere else and listen and join the conversation. And that seems to be more natural to them. So the difficulties may also lie in the integration of cross verbal and nonverbal communication aspects. In social relationships, uh, we need to uh, tackle the myth that autistic people do not uh, need friends, which is a wrong uh, presumption. They can all definitely have interest to social relationships and peer interaction with developmentally appropriate desire for friendships, but they might find it difficult to navigate and manage, and they can actually be naive in relationships so that make them more vulnerable uh, to be exploited, for example. Um, um, they, they, they can definitely figure out other people's thoughts, although that may not be so easy for them. It doesn't come intuitively to them, but they can invest efforts into that. Uh, they may invest lots of uh, energy to prepare for social interactions, but afterwards feeling exhausted and drained. In the restricted heavy behavior domain, uh, repetitiveness may not be apparent to motor mannerisms, you know, as seen in boys most of the time, but they can manifest as uh, different language expressions, uh, including pedantic, detailed, or precise language. Uh, insist on sameness in many cases uh, can, uh, can present themselves in terms of rigidity or even just perfectionistic uh, traits or preoccupation uh, with details. And they may, can also manifest as strictly following the rules, they abide the rule, or even things like a black and white thinking. Uh, the circumscribed interest uh, can be typical to neurotypical and gendered contexts. Uh, they do not have to be spaceship uh, 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 numbers or dinosaurs. They can be about animals, uh, sub opera, music, history, uh, novel, literature. Um, they can engage in circumscribes interest a lot, but they can still be exhaustive. Uh, sensory aspects, uh, both hyper and hypo responsivity can present within the same modality. They can actually be related to uh, difficulties in interoception, which is actually quite missed by many people. For example, not being aware of hunger, thirst, or other internal feelings. Uh, they can also present as enhanced perception, and they can manifest behaviorally as eating problems or as uh, uh, differences in terms of choosing uh, their outfit because of sensory aspects. Now, the most challenging part probably relates to criteria C of DSM-5, which speaks to the fact that there, there could be people who have early developmental features of autism, but they're not apparent, and they are not uh, uh, recognized until later stages uh, because of decompensation, or they're simply masked. So as I argued earlier, camouflaging is not diagnostic to autism. Uh, it is a ubiquitous phenomenon that uh, human beings uh, basically do and perform. So it's part of impression management. However, in autistic people, this should be recognizable. So that, first of all, there needs to be something to be masked for, and they usually are present uh, from early in life. And autistic people will tell us that they, they recognize that or they are so prone to that. So there's a process of practicing or rehearsal 
that they exercise it over time and it was less successful initially but over time some of them may feel that they are better at it but even if they are better at it there should still be observable signs of this effort which can manifest as the, the exhaustion and withdrawal after a social performance or social interaction. Um, some of them may be related to this idea of autistic burnout as uh, 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 reported by many autistic people. Um, camouflaging, because they are scripted, it can be inflexible across different contexts. So for example, um, I, I, this is the example I learned from my friend Dina, uh, Dina Gessner, who talked about uh, she can uh, script things well, but the most challenging part is uh, it, when she was thrown into a cocktail party, there are lots of unpredictability about how people interact with each other, and that's so exhausting and so so challenging. And through the process, there could be desynchronization during the interpersonal interactions. So, so there could be out of sync episodes in the long interaction, especially at the latter part of interaction for autistic people, even if they can mask or camouflage quite well at the beginning side of the interaction. But there is an effort of keeping up with the synchronization. And the, the overall picture is that uh, there needs to be a, a clinical impairment by DSM-5, but that can also include the subjective sufferings uh, because of all these. Um, so they can feel easily exhausted because of the impression management effort and the subjective distress because of these, because they are related to autism related features, that should be considered as part of the clinical diagnosis. However, they can be context dependent because we, we do have lots of kids uh, who uh, are not recognized very clearly in school settings, but they sort of like keep things uh, in place, but then they like, have to let things out when they can come back home. So, so there's a discrepancy in different contexts. Uh, many of them actually require time alone to recover and restore their energy. So again, the overall clinical gestalt of the behavior cognitive profile is the key for understanding and you know, for clinicians to give a diagnosis in the end. Uh, finally, there are some associated features that can commonly coexist. They're not diagnostic to autism, but they are important clinically. Uh, emotion dysregulation issues, uh, difficulty understanding own emotion, uh, for example, alexithymia, uh, can often co-occur. Uh, there can be a presence of imaginative pretend play, but some of them, some I mean, in many cases, this may be uh, setting up things uh, rather than having figures uh, uh, showing agency interacting with each other, and they can be scripted uh, quite a lot. Uh, many of them have good structural language abilities, especially in expression, and in many cases, there is a presence of hyperlexia in early ages. However, people have difficulty with executive functioning, especially about daily adaptive skills, and some of them may present body focus, repetitive behaviors, um, and they may not reach the level of adaptation or achievement as expected given their intellectual or cognitive capability. And there can be a related uh, fluidity and variance in gender expression and identity, as well as sexual orientation and sexual identity. So in the clinical diagnostic process, especially for the nuanced phenotype, I think it is important for us to not only consider the observation and the informant report, which is classical across all pediatric practice. It is also important to consider the subjective experiences of the individual and take that into consideration for the overall clinical development of Gestalt. This is a picture uh, from a Taiwanese scholar, uh, sorry, Taiwanese autistic uh, young person who draw to uh, describe how he found it to be difficult to uh, understand and catch up with other facial expressions. And you can see this is vividly um, uh, expressing the, the, the effort and the challenge uh, and the motivation to, uh, to catch up or understand what's happening between uh, uh, the facial expression exchanges. And these are really, really rich subjective experiences that we need to rely on for us to uh, understand uh, the lived experiences of autistic people and really seriously consider that in our clinical diagnostic assessment and uh, support planning. With that, I would like to thank, uh, thank all of you uh, sitting here. I know it's the end of the day uh, for all of you. 
And I would like to thank uh, the funders and all the autistic people and families that we've worked with and gave us their insights about uh, all these experiences. And thank you very much. I'm happy to uh, take questions and discuss with all of you. Merci beaucoup, Professeur Meng Chuan Lai. Merci beaucoup pour ce, cet exposé euh, d'une particulière densité euh, basée sur tellement de preuves scientifiques qui est vraiment le, le pendant euh, extrêmement complet de cette journée qui vient de se passer, en particulier des dernières interventions. Euh, nous sommes vraiment très, très heureux d'avoir pu euh, entendre votre propos. Euh, on aurait voulu euh, peut-être euh, approfondir chaque diapo tellement elle euh, recelait d'éléments euh, extrêmement importants dans notre pratique euh, quotidienne. Et comme je le disais précédemment, l'autisme féminin, c'est un, un monde que nous devons encore euh, approfondir et découvrir euh, ici en France. Donc euh, merci encore de cet éloge de la nuance. Euh, et euh, merci encore de pouvoir euh, nous aider à grandir dans notre représentation de, de l'autisme féminin et en particulier euh, sur les pré idées préconçues qui peuvent être présentes. Alors nous n'aurons pas le temps d'avoir de, de, de de, des questions. Je, je retiendrai euh, « I'm Sheldon, but I look like Penny ». Je retiendrai à M. Sheldon, but I, but I look like Penny, comme étant euh, la, phrase, euh, la phrase de ce soir. Et j'essaierai de m'en rappeler à chaque fois que nous aurons des, des diagnostics à faire. Un grand merci de nous avoir accordé tout ce temps et de nous avoir parlé de, de si loin. Merci à vous encore. On vous réapplaudit. Au revoir. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure. And I really want to be there with all of you and hope there's a chance that we can connect and discuss more. And thank you very much for having me.